coming out for a lot of study. Um, um, on a sunny, on a sunny day. Um, so uh, this paper returns to that moment in the 1920s and 1930s when the Soviet Union was a beacon for all manner of utopian thinking about alternatives to capitalism. And when a range of astoundingly energized and talented artists set to the task of imagining and designing a communist way of life. Furniture, homes, factories, magazines, books, posters, movies, street signs, movie theaters, theater itself, city streets, stores, tractors, agriculture, public transportation, the metro, uh, hospitals, etc. Everything was up for redesign with a new communist, comradely, collective <coughs> way of life. One motive here, just in, in, in talking about it in this context, um, is to open up a travel in a way of thinking about design that's untethered from the present neoliberal capitalist mode in which design thinking seems like it's a neutral term, but it presumes global capitalism as its setting, functioning as a synonym for the production of consumer goods, or at best for making capital more efficient and perhaps a little less cruel through new technologies or designs, whether it's ecosystem. So, as our colleague John Pat Leary put it in his new book, keywords, design thinking often employs a rhetoric of design that is suspicious of utopian political situations to social problems, if the possibility is acknowledged at all, but optimistically ambitious in its appraisal of potential technical solutions. Thus, solutions are unmoored from a political program that might address the inequities that make them necessary in the first place. This is a perspective that depoliticizes scarcity, treating it as a technical problem rather than one of resource inequality or explo exploitation. That's John Patrick. In this context, I want to return precisely to utopian political projects and to briefly consider the place occupied by radio in the project of imagining, representing, and making world communism. In its capacity to communicate across long distances, to annihilate distance, as the poet Velimir Klebnikov put it, it was crucial not only for the organization of revolutionary movements and taking power, indeed, and surprisingly, the Bolsheviks made the radio's immediate predecessor, the wireless telegraph office, a key goal uh, in the revolution. Uh, but it also played a key role in the unification of different peoples within the new communist nation without depending on literacy. So the newspaper couldn't do. And then to the possibility of reaching a global mass audience and aiding in the agitational and propagandistic part of creating a worldwide revolution. It was no mistake that a number of the earliest and most powerful Soviet radio stations were called Comintern, which of course is the uh, contracted name of the communist National, the group tasked with fomenting a worldwide revolution. But more than this, and to my primary focus today, is the way that the experience of listening to the radio, this photo is a boy, this photo by Rochinka, uh, of listening to the radio, of what craft work, and from a man later called radio activity, of pulling information out of the air floating there for you and for me, coming from somewhere far away and meeting you in the intimate space right next to your ear, how that seemed at this moment in the 1920s to be a particular kind of communist feeling. I propose to understand the promise of the radio, the locus of its most powerful utopian impulses, in terms of the concept of the world sense, or mira ashushinia, which really has some similarities with the System, which was outlined by Sergei Tretyakov in his 1923 essay, um, uh, this is the journal Lef, Akuda uh, Ikuda, From Where and To Where, it's 1923. It's a big, sort of serious essay, but I'll, 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 I'll sum up what I take to be sort of it's like four key points. Um, the first point to make here is that the world sense for Tretyakov uh, refers to the world of emotion and feeling, not knowledge or. Um, the term world sense, he writes, 
denotes the sum of all emotional judgments that arise in the human being. The effort to create communism, he's arguing, has to concern itself with things like the lines of sympathy and repulsion, uh, repulsion, friendship and enmity, joy and sadness, sadness, fear and courage. So that's first one. It's not emotion. Second, emotions for Chechenkov constitute judgments. Feelings are, in this sense, a way of determining value at the most basic level of something is worth paying attention to, for how long, what kind of attention. And then third, and following from these previous two, that world sense constitutes a system of motivation. The level of energy, he writes, in the individual, the joy of involvement, of fierce persistence devoted to his production collective, the degree of his infectious enthusiasm for work, this is the practical significance of the world sense. And then four, the world sense is the form, it's a form given to our affects as a totality. It works, he says, like a complex fabric. A world sense thus constitutes an atmosphere that makes certain feelings about certain objects possible while foreclosing other kinds of feelings. In this sense, daily, daily life, Tretyakov argues, is shaped by world senses. What we subjectively call everyday life, he says, is the system of feelings and actions which have become automatized by repetition in conformity with a particular socioeconomic basis which have become a habit and which are extremely durable. It works, the world sense works in creating habits. Am I excited about getting the paper or am I anxious about it? Does one want to take the metro or do I want to take my car or do I want to my bike? Am I going to give money to the homeless person on the street? Will I be envious of my more successful colleague? These more local feelings in relation to specific objects are organized by what he's calling the world sense and the habits they form. Consequently, if, as Tretyakov writes, the revolution is, must reorganize human emotions in everyday life, then the way that we do that is, by, is not by, we don't do that by sort of telling people what to feel, but it doesn't work to say, you know, stop liking don't love your kid, give your kid up to live in a collective uh, uh, place for raising children. Don't believe in the couple as the basis of romantic uh, love. You know, uh, be interested in tractors now, be ashamed of your wealth, etc. It doesn't work like that. As we all know, it does that, that, that doesn't work very well. Instead, it works at the level of, of what Trish calls the world sense. Um, and by way of institutions like schools or humanity centers or health insurance for everybody or public transportation. Imagine what weights, how different weights they would be if one could just hop on a metro and come from like the local events like Detroit. It would change the way that we feel about being here. Um, you change individual feelings by changing the world sense, creating a new system of habits, inclinations, likes, and dislikes. And so radio, I think you can easily see, presents itself as having a particular promise in this project. It makes habits, it creates an atmosphere. In an important sense, it makes a new world. And not only by connecting you to the far, but also by reshaping what is close by. As Stephen Lobel tells us, has an important history, the radio caught the imagination of early Soviet society like no other medium. And the poet I mentioned earlier, Klevnikov, um, enthused particularly energetically in his essay, Radio of the Future, in which he, <coughs> I'm, going, uh, I'm, running, I'm, I'm already behind time, so uh, basically the case that Klopnikov makes is that the radio will create something like a new natural environment, a new uh, ecosystem, if you will. Unlike our present one, and, and, and unlike our present one, it will forge, he writes, continuous links in the universal soul, that's, that's Russian poetry for you, and mold mankind into a single entity. In creating a new kind of collective being at a new scale, the radio, he writes, will replace the church, becoming as important as the school or the library. So now I want to turn to this film by Ziga Bertov, um, called Enthusiasm, the Donbass Symphony, which is basically about the five-year you know, five plan, the new sort of economic plan, uh, as it uh, took shape in the Ukraine in uh, 1929. 
And in this film, the radio becomes a figure for communism uh, and, uh, and also for Bertov's introduction of sound into film. Because this was Bertov's first sound film. Right, so he's also kind of reflecting on that uh, sort of self reflexively at the same time. So I'm going to show you one clip that's about a minute. So then I'm going to show you like a bit of Uh, not only 
only spatially, but emotionally as well. It makes it possible to care about events and people that are far away, to bring them into the zone of your daily concern, and perhaps to feel that people far away care about you as well. And in so doing, to expand the range of things that matter. Crucially, it does so without any corresponding perceptual feedback. We don't feel the distance that the radio waves are traveling before they reach our radio, not like we feel the distance when we travel in a train or plane anyway. We don't even see or know exactly where these sounds are coming from, even if we know that it's not coming from this little object we're carrying around. Voices have left the body, they're in the air, which is part of why the experience can be both weird and thrilling. As Alan Weiss put it, his fantastic book on radio. Radiophonic airspace is a necropolis riddled with dead voices, the voices of the dead and dead air, all cut off from their originary bodies, all now transmitted to the outer international and cosmic airwaves in order to re-enter our inner ears. The sounds and voices we hear hover in some uncertain space between here and there, present and absent, dead and alive, a space filled with a kind of open-ended, collective potential. So for instance, in a story from 26, another Soviet writer, uh, Mikhail Grishvin, talked about how listening to the radio headphones created the feeling of an inner international. The radio is common, it's everywhere, uh, and it's for everyone. And part of the power is that we know that others, often many others, are also listening to the same thing at the same time. And I think it's this crazy, weird, uncanny confluence of far and near that can make one giddy or amazed that is important and compelling to Vertov here. <clears throat> the near, I think, for Vertov is valued to the precise extent that it is brought into contact with the far. The soundtrack is one model for this transformation. And this is a relatively common way, like the scholarship on like Walkman and headphones and stuff. The soundtrack is a common way to describe what it is to like walk through the city with headphones on. You walk through the city with headphones on, it's like you're like in a movie, right? It's like you're, um, you're you know, you have your own private soundtrack to like your um, progress through daily life. But I think this is not necessarily solipsistic uh, or individuating. And I think Vertov sees a potential here that was something like what Walter Benjamin saw in uh, you know, his famous writings on film, including uh, one of his pieces on like, early Soviet cinema uh, that was then like adapted for the later famous essay on art in the age of its psychological reproducibility. Here's, here's Benjamin, a passage that's hopefully not too obfuscating. Film, he writes, is the prism, prism in which the spaces of the immediate environment the spaces in which people live, pursue their avocations, enjoy their leisure, are laid open before their eyes in a comprehensible, meaningful, and passionate way. In themselves, offices, furnished rooms, saloons, big city streets, stations, and factories are ugly, incomprehensible, and hopelessly sad. Or rather, they were, and seems to be, until the advent of film, and now we can take extended journeys of adventure between their widely scattered sense of the films are opening things up. To view the world and the other people in it as if we are all together in it in a film allows it for Benjamin and I think for Veritas also to be emotionally open to that world, to like it, to feel it in a way that might be impossible when we have our anesthetizing, psychic, defensive shields up. The soundtrack changes our relationship to what we see, how we feel about what we see, by way of its rhythms, the surging of the melodies, it creates a different world sense. We can have different emotions about what is in front of us precisely because our world has been altered by way of our soundtrack. Here, the near becomes more valued to the precise extent that it is brought into contact with the far. Lenin, uh, Vladimir Lenin, uh, himself discussed this in very interesting the radio. For him, uh, though, he talks about it, he's like, you know, the radio makes you that people are far away, so you're less likely to, like, eat all the grain that you just picked, because you have a sense of, like, these other people, this grain uh, is going to, or whatever it is that we're the, 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 the 
wood that he just that he, that he cut, that he cut down. And he's quite optimistic about its possibility for making the far as equally uh, equally as compelling as the near. So I'm just about out of time. I was going to say a word about Langston Hughes, the African American poet, who also, after his visit to the Soviet Union, became very interested in the transformational powers of the radio, the politically and emotionally transformational powers of the radio, the revolutionary possibility of the radio. But I'll just uh, conclude with one a couple more sentences. If, as Weiss, uh, when I was talking about dead voices, uh, mentioned the radio doesn't distinguish between the dead and the living. It's fundamentally ghostly. I can listen to Sean Gaffin or Lynn or Bill Holiday, Billy Holiday or David Bowie. The radio reminds us also of our capacity to be connected to the dead, to be attuned to their rhythms. If it does that, it might also, under the right circumstances, evoke a powerful melancholic impulse to save the dead, to redeem them, to fan a spark of hope in the past, like the blues or the sorrow songs that we voice wrote of over a hundred years ago, seizing the sense of open-ended potential and seizing it with all the others who are listening with their headphones. A thousand people just like me on a thousand islands of the sea, just waiting for the moment that they can find each other free to join the sirens that are calling them, not into their movement, but toward the ruin of the world that presses them, the one that required them to imagine the world otherwise by way of their headphones in the first place. Thanks.
partition there was the, the church. And the only, the only thing that communism had uh, since it was that inner voice coming from the Lutner, and since they had no way of creating this kind of interior Soviet idea, that there was, that, that would be a logical way to try to induce it. But since there was no content, uh, they had put an internal freight inside uh, what was there to go with. I mean, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're a church, you'll pray or you're doing whatever, but if you've got a pair of head, headsets on, where does this internal reality come from? Uh, you mean, what's the content of what's coming through the through the radio, or what's the yeah, nature yeah. of the sort of, what's, I mean, the, what's the thing that people are becoming attached to? Yeah, the I mean, good. oh, like, you're in this private little bubble, but then there's no, this, and you yourself said there's no ideological so what's there? Well, I think there is an ideological content in this sense. I mean, I guess there's two things to say. Maybe this sort of modifies what I was saying a little bit earlier. I think in Klebnikov and in Vertov as well, there's a sense that there's something essentially communist about the radio, right? I mean, maybe, I mean they're all resetting the case a little bit, you know, you know I mean, they're sort of they're trying to be like a utopia about it. But I think there is a sense that the radio, precisely because it allows you to be connected, emotionally connected, to people who are far away, to feel like those people matter to you, precisely because of the proximity with which they, uh, that, that, that they arrive um, to you, can create a new way of being connected to a broad, uh, imagined community. And of course, the task of the community, among other things, in relation to the Veritas Film, about the five-year plan, it's about a community and enthusiasm for collective labor, right? Um, is the, uh, is the, project and it's like you know they just had a revolution they, I mean which was led by the people so people are interested people are already interested in communism you know in other words people people are already interested in creating a non-capitalist egalitarian um, economic mode uh, of existence the task is sort of how to sustain and spread that I guess what I'm trying to say is that private bubble, bubble in the sense that you're talking about the head bubble, you know, in, in a sense, in a, in a religious institution, you have a church, okay, you have a, you have a sense that it's a private public, shall we say, sharing. But if you're putting on a sense of head bubble, uh, and you're getting whatever it is that they're giving you on, on a bubble, what, what content would it would was it that sense of the, the Soviet uh, collective? What, what, what was it they were trying to? What were they so enthusiastic about? Is what I'm trying to say. Well, in, in the movie, they're enthusiastic about fulfilling the five-year plan um, <laughs> and meeting. It. They're enthusiastic about exceeding their goals for green and coal production. Is what they're uh, is what they're enthusiastic about. Um, I think what the woman who's listening to the radio is enthusiastic about is this sort of, it's just the like miraculous possibility of being connected with these people who are far away. In other words, to her, it does not seem like a bubble, right? The point being, and here the social context is sort of crucial, right? We think of the, the, the radio, the, the headphones are only a bubble in a world in which you feel like you need to escape from something, right? If you listen to, I mean, there's a lot of um, scholarship on this now. About it with a lot of sort of self-reporting about you know why do you wear it why do you wear an iPod when you're like on the subway or whatever it's like so the guy so I don't have to listen to the guy who's like uh, making unwanted sexual advances or give um, uh, you know um, directions to the tourists who like to stop me or whatever right so they, you know, they're stimuli they're sort of encroaching in this in the world that Veritas represents that isn't there. There's no need to negate those things that are right around you. So the task instead is to connect. Voila, the radio uh, enters into the scene as a kind of almost uh, miraculous way to provide that connection to the things that are far away. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think just an important part of that too is not only that people far away matter to you, but you might matter to them too. Yes. It's something you said in your talk. I, I'm sort of pulling from that, I'm wondering, I, I, I find headphones definitely connecting to a network, uh, um, especially depending on what you're listening to. But sort of the new, like 
oncoming mode of radio are airwaves, but podcasts, right? This is how increasingly people are, are listening to what they call radio. And radio is, as was said, and I didn't write down who quoted them, but from some other time, but it's sort of like floating in the airwaves and, and information floating and being captured, almost like sticking out your fingertip in a butterfly or something. It's magical, right? But podcasts are, are, are like a medium of choice, right? You scroll through and you, you aren't waiting for someone's uh, you know, voice to flow down from the Acropolis. You're like picking the, the program you want. Um, in, in which sense, that idea of you mattering to the other person far away seemed to sort of slip away because all of a sudden you are really just, you're a number in their, in their statistic sheet of how many downloads, rather than this sort of leap of faith to like, put your voice out into the airways and then hope uh, there's someone in, you know, uh, hopes who's going to uh, hear the other end. Um, I just wonder how that, like, mediumship uh, sort of changes the, the mission of the magic of the radio. Yes, yeah, a good question. Uh, an interesting one. Um, you know, you might talk about Spotify or something, too, right? Yeah. Where, um, right, it's not a broadcast. Um, you're listening to a sequence of songs that have been picked out especially for you um, by the algorithm that has come to your previous musical choices. And, and it's, it's good, good too. It's all right, good. right. It's great. I mean, you know, that doesn't produce the sense that somebody cares about you and about what does, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, no, but it's, I mean, right. So the entrepreneurial like move there to make the Spotify that makes it feel like they're caring about you is precisely the thing that actually like disconnects you. It's connecting you to an algorithm, or it's connecting you to you, right? So, yeah, I think that is consequentially different, though I don't think it's, though I again would resist the impulse to say that it is necessarily uh, individualizing or isolating. Um, you know, I don't know, the podcasts I listen to are like, you know, are like socialists or whatever. So it's, <laughs> so it's like, you know, um, it's about political organizing. I mean, it's actually explicitly about political organizing, right? So the people who are uh, addressing me by way of the con uh, by way of the podcast are doing so as part of an already defined collective political project. So that's something too, right? That I sort of feel like, I mean, again, that sort of there's not a necessary um, political content to its use. Though I think you're right, the algorithm. Uh, Changes the quality of the mediation in important ways that I sat in this room about eight or nine years ago, I think, during the LA Media Conference for a workshop about community radio. And it was right after they had the little power FM signals um, that had about a three to five mile radius. And I'm just curious if you had any thoughts about. Um, as culture has shifted sort of away from traditional radio, uh, they sort of abandoned it and give it back to these small communities to uh, utilize it um, in a place where we sometimes feel more disconnected from the person next door than we do from around the world. Just if you had any thoughts about, about what that trend in the radio culture is, that might be. Yeah, it's hard to be optimistic about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's the I mean the thing that's also important about Spotify and um, podcasts is it like costs more money actually because like the, I have like the phone the smartphone is like it's like a few hundred bucks you know when I was a little kid I had like a little portable Panasonic radio that was like five ninety nine or something that I listened to just in a little like one ear you know sort of earphone. Um, it was AM, you know, I'm old, it was AM radio, right? So um, it was broadcast, and it was, you know, there was like five radio stations. So it was like, and only three of them like had music or something, right? So you also had the sense of like, you were listening with like all these other people, which I feel like is important. It's not only that you're connecting to someone who's far away and broadcasting to you, who you feel like might care about you, but you're also connecting to all the other, the thousand other people on a thousand islands in the sea or whatever, who are also listening to the radio. And, and, and I feel like that's part of the thrill of listening the radio is the awareness of all these other people who are listening to it at the same at the same time. 
I mean, it's like now it, it, it feels like a kind of, um, to sort of start up a radio station um, and to invest political hope in that feels um, like nostalgic or something, right, um, in the current context. Although, I feel like it still can maintain its political utility, especially in, in like, um, Whatever, like uh, revolutionary like uh, war situations where like uh, you know the communists in Rojava or whatever can receive stuff from a broadcast radio station like across the border. I mean, you know, the radio stations don't the, you, you can't stop them at the borders. You know, they don't really. So the Soviet Union spent a lot of um, or you know spent money funding like all these radio stations around South Africa during apartheid that the ANC would broadcast from, and it's like South Africa. It. So I feel like there is, I can imagine current situations in which a kind of insurgent radio would still have a kind of um, collectivity creating political power. But yeah, it's a good question to think about. Like, 